Hi, I'm Dr. Williams, and today we're going to be reviewing how to do a LEAP procedure. We are using sausage for demonstration purposes. So one of the first things to remember is that when the patient comes in, you'll obviously do an informed consent and a timeout. Part of the important things that you'll be doing is picking the right size speculum so you can get good visualization, and then also deciding which type of LEAP you're going to do. My favorite is actually the medium fissure, but this is not appropriate for every cervix, so you will have to learn how to decide that. There are some different sized leaps that you can use. The next step is I do a brief colposcopy on the patient and just making sure that I can visualize kind of the worrisome spots. And when you do the leap, you actually want to excise the entire squamoclonar junction. The next thing that I do is actually numb up her cervix using the, uh, a Pidaki needle. So this is the Pidaki needle. It is the same needle that's used for dental procedures. So you can see that there is a guide here so you not go too deep. It is important that you also aspirate to make sure that you're not in a blood vessel. When I numb up the cervix, I actually do half a vial of the lidocaine with epinephrine at 12 o'clock, then the other half at three o'clock. I reload the vial and do it do more at, at another half vial at 6 o'clock and at 9 o'clock. I then reload with another vial and do either a half a vial or a quarter of a vial at, between all of those locations. I find doing resident education that I want to make sure that the patient is very numb and at times, depending on where the squamoclonar junction is, some of the lidocaine will actually come out through the columnar cells. So that's why I want to make sure that the patient is completely anesthetized. And they do very well with this. It doesn't seem to bother them or seem that uncomfortable for them to be numbed. The next thing that I do is when I'm ready to um, actually start the procedure, I then turn on the vacuum. So we'll do that. I make sure that my cervix is, that I can see the entire thing that I need to see. I do not look through my scope while I'm doing this procedure. I look off to the side of it. Um, I do try to keep it visualized for the rest of the, um, the learners in the room. So then I tell my nurse to make the, to turn the um, leap machine to live so that we can do cut. Remember that this is not a cheese slicer that this is actually an, a, a wire that the electricity courses through and it heats up the water in the cervix and that's what actually makes the cut. So once again, it is not a cheese slicer. So there's some key things to remember. You'll notice that this has a bar on it and you want to bury this in the woman's cervix all the way to that bar and then you want to go at a nice steady speed and rotate it counterclockwise. The reason that you can remember that it's counterclockwise is there's actually this hook on it that goes that way. So that's just reminding you of where to go. I decide where I'm going to make my nick at based on where the most um, problem areas are on the cervix. So if the cervical lesion is at 3 o'clock, I'm going to start my biopsy or my leap at 4 o'clock and, and rotate that way. I should mention that we talk about the cervix like the face of a clock. So when I say four o'clock, it's like you're imagining that you're looking at a, a clock. One of the other things that I find is the speed of the of doing the procedure. You need to be nice and steady. Okay, so I'll go ahead and demonstrate this. specimen. So that actually is what it really does look like. Um, I did have a little bit of technical difficulty with my sausage because I need to have somebody holding it so it doesn't move because the patient normally would not have that issue. Um, one of the other things I want to make sure that you're aware of is that it's important that you start the electricity before you go into the cervix and then you keep the electricity on the entire time until you come out. That's very important. So I'm actually very happy with what my specimen looks like. The next thing I'm going to demonstrate is a leap using what I call, what I refer to as a regular loop electrode. 
There are many women that the fissure is not appropriate for. This, after people have had babies, the cervical, the cervical os can be more of, they call it like fish mouth, so it can extend from one side of the cervix all the way to the other side. So if you try to do the fissure, it comes out in multiple pieces. So this is another type of loop that is very, that's very reasonable to use. You want to remember when you're doing a leap that you're trying to excise the entire squamoculonar junction. So there's at times that you're going to have to take more than one pass. With that being said, this, this is a reasonable size and there's multiple sizes that I'll demonstrate later. I find that the way that I hold my hand, the, the hand positioning that works the best for me is actually to hold it like a pencil and then I like to grasp hold of my wrist and then I actually am rather dramatic with my body motions where I go into the cervix and then go across and then come straight back out. The most common mistakes are once again that the, the doctor does not bury it all the way to the bar or that the doctor goes too fast where there's drag and then they are not able to excise the entire thing. That, that will happen um, even with the best of colposcopists and leap providers. And sometimes you have to do what's called a revision and go back and trim off the cells that you, the other parts of the cervix that you need to. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate this on the cervix. I am getting some drag. I'm just going to keep going. And I actually go farther than what I think I need to go. And that tends to help. get exactly what I want to get. So I'm actually very pleased looking at that at my specimen. You can see you can see that if you look at it, you can tell that I did I was deeper when I first started and I came out a little bit. It's really hard not to do that. And it's reasonable to do that some amount. You just don't want it to be too extreme to be too shallow when you end. With this, if the patient had abnormal cells and on her endocervical keratage, then I would also do what's called, referred to as a top hat. I do like to numb the patient up again at that point. I take another vial of lidocaine with epinephrine and I once again inject at 12 o'clock and then I do it at another half vial at three o'clock and I take another vial and I do it at six o'clock and then again at nine o'clock. I just, it's really important that the patient not feel, feel anything during this. There are many providers that will do these in the operating room and I do provide them in the operating room, but I also find that this actually works well in the clinic setting if you pick the right patient. If you have a patient who's way too nervous, then it is, I think, better to do it in the operating room or if you have a patient that you're worried about having excessive bleeding, or I've done some on like HIV positive women, um, I have done those in the operating room. And I am going to turn down my setting. Um, one thing to be aware of is that depending on the size of the loop that you use, if it's a smaller wire, then you're gonna use a lower amount of electricity. Um, so for the first one, I used a setting of 46 on cut, and this one I'm gonna do 36 on, on cut. Um, you can do what's called a blend, and that's very common to do. I find with my machine that the cut alone works very well. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Remember that your machines do vary, and so there are places that you would need to have it at a much higher setting. My old machine, need to be set at like in the 70s. So there is a dramatic variation between some of those. Now I'm gonna go ahead and very happy with that specimen. You can't tell on the screen maybe as well as what I would like, but this is just 
um, where I excised from what would be around the cervical os to give me more of an insurance I had gotten everything I needed to get. The next thing that I would do is I'd actually take a ball electrode and I would full grate around the edges. I am not going to actually do this because it makes so much smoke. I will do just a brief one, but it, you, know, you basically just burn all the way around these edges. And then I go a ball width or two more internal, just being very careful to avoid the os. One of the other things that I do is I will do an endocervical curettage after elite. If there's any, if they had a positive ECC or if there's any question that there could be some remaining disease, that gives me more insight when I get my pathology back if the abnormal cells extend to the margins. If I have, it, where it extends to the margins and I have a negative ECC, then I'm much more reassured that I got what I needed to get with that um, lead procedure.